Welcome to our lecture online and now we've seen a number of these theories, the South Evidence Theorem, Norton's Theorem, the Superposition Theorem, and what I wanted to do here is compare that to how you would solve a circuit problem like this using Kirchhoff's rules, because Kirchhoff's rules are just kind of general rules that can really be used for almost any circuit. And so let's compare that. So now you have something to compare to, see which methods you like the best. And sometimes some methods are better for certain situations, other methods are better for other situations. So let's see how Kirchhoff's rules would help you solve this problem. So what are Kirchhoff's rules? Well, there are two. The first rule uh, for Kirchhoff is that when you have, whenever you have a junction, like right here, we know that all the currents entering that junction must equal to all the currents leaving that junction. It's kind of like an intersection. If you stand by an intersection and watch all the cars entering the intersection and all the cars leaving the intersection, by the end of the day, the exact same number of cars entered the intersection as left the intersection. They don't just don't disappear in the middle of the intersection. Same with charges. However many charges enter a branch, the same number of charges leave the branch. So the sum of the currents leaving must equal the sum of the currents entering. That's rule number one. Rule number two. Kirchhoff said if you go around any loop, no matter which loop, you can go around the loop here, you can go around the loop there, you can go around the loop like this, doesn't matter, you can go in any direction you want, doesn't matter. He said that all the voltage adds and all the voltage drops. So whenever you go across a battery from the negative end to the positive end, there's a voltage uh, rise. And whenever you go across a resistor in the direction of the current, there's a voltage drop. You add up all the voltage rise and all the voltage drops together. When you go around a single loop, they always add up to zero. No matter which direction you go, no matter you go left or right, clockwise, counterclockwise, around any loop, the voltages add up to zero. Those two rules together will set up circuit equations that allow you to solve for the currents of any branch in any kind of uh, circuit like this. All right, so let's go ahead and let's get started. The first thing you want to do, though, is indicate which direction you think the current is going to flow. Now, you could be wrong, and that's okay if you're wrong. That just means that the current flows in the opposite direction. You'll get a negative answer, so it's not a big deal. But here, it does look like the current will flow in this direction. So let's call that I1. And then you assume that the current will split up into this branch and this branch. So let's call this current I2, and let's call this current I3. Now, this circuit, if you looked at the other videos, should look familiar because it's the exact same circuit, so we should hopefully get the exact same answers. So those are the three currents we're looking for, and since we have a branch right here, we can see that this one current, I1, must equal to the sum of these two currents right there, so that's our first equation. We can say that I1 is equal to I2 plus I3. Now we need, so now we have three unknowns. In order to solve three unknowns, we're going to need three equations. So we need two additional equations, and we're going to get that from Kirchhoff's second rule, which says you go around any loop, all the voltages should add up. So we're going to get an equation by going around this loop. Let's call that loop number one, and let's take this loop number two, and we're going to go around the loop that way. And again, it doesn't matter which direction you go around the loop. It makes no difference at all. So let's go around the loop for loop number one. And let's start at this point right there and go all the way around. So the first thing we do is go across the battery. That means there's a voltage rise of 56 volts. I'm going to leave off the units because that makes the equation a lot cleaner to work with. And let me move it up just a little bit because I don't want to run out of room. So we have voltage rise of 56 volts going from there to there. Now we go across the resistor in the same direction as the current. So there we have a voltage drop and the voltage drop will be equal to the product of the current times the product of the resistance. So in this case, it's going to be minus 8R, oh, 8I1. I don't want to write I. So that's the resistance of R1 multiplied times I1. So that's the voltage drop across this resistor. Then we come around the corner here. Now we go across this resistor, again, in the same direction as the current. If you go in the same direction as the current, you have a voltage drop. So the voltage drop there is minus the resistance, which is 4 ohms times the current, which is I2, and then you end up back in the same spot where you started, and so that should add up to zero. There's your second equation. So we're simply summing up all the voltage rises and all the voltage drops in that one loop, and they add up to zero. Loop number two, there we get our second, uh, or our third equation. Uh, let's, say, let's see here, we start at this location right there, and we'll just go around the loop like this. So first we go across this resistor, but now notice we now go against the current, when you go against the current you've, across a resistor, you will have a voltage rise. So here we have a plus uh, current I2 plus, times 4 ohms. So that would be plus 4 I2. 
plus because we're going against the current. So it's a voltage rise instead of a voltage drop. We come around the corner here. Here we go with the current. So this, that will be a voltage drop. Resistance times current. So that would be minus 2 times I3. And finally, we go across the battery, but in this case, we go across the battery from the positive end to the negative end, so that's the voltage drop. So it's minus 14. Then we get back to the same spot, so all that should add up to zero. So now we have our three equations and three unknowns, and now it's just an algebra exercise to solve for these three equations. So the first thing you want to do is use your first equation right here. Since it's already solved for one of your two currents, or one of your three currents, I1, you then want to replace I1 by what I1 is equal to in either one of these two other equations. Now notice, you only need to do it here because this equation does not have I1 in it. So if you replace this equation I1, or this I1 in this equation by I2 plus I3, you've eliminated I1 and now you've reduced a three equation, three unknown kind of problem to a two equation, two unknown kind of problem. So let's do that. So equation 1 now will become 56 minus 8 times I1, which is I2 plus I3, minus 4I2 equals 0. So that's your new second equation with I1 replaced by I2 plus I3. And there's your third equation, which, which uh, remains unchanged. So we have 4I2 minus 2I3 minus 14 equals 0. Okay, so now we want to put into a format where it's easier to solve. So you're going to have all your i terms on the left and all the constants to the right. So here we have a minus 8i2 and a minus 4i2. Combine that as minus 12i2. Minus 12i2. Here we have a minus 8i3. That's the only i3 you've got. Minus 8i3. And we take the 56 on the left side, move it to the right side. That becomes a minus 56. All right. Second equation, we have a 4i2 minus 2i3, and then we bring the 14 across, that becomes a positive 14 on the other side. So now we have ourselves a nice set of two equations and two unknowns. So we're getting closer to the result. The next step is we want to eliminate one of those two variables, either i2 or i3. And when I look at this, if I multiply the second equation by 3, I will end up with a 4, uh, I mean a 4 times 3, or 12 i2. I can then add the two equations, and i2 will just simply drop away. So I'm going to use what we call the elimination method by multiplying the bottom equation by 3. So of course I have to multiply everything by 3. So let's now move over here. Of course the top equation will go unchanged, so it's minus 12 i2 minus 8 i3 equals minus 56. The bottom equation, 3 times 4, that gives me 12 i2. 3 times a minus 2 gives me minus 6 i3. And 3 times a 14 gives me 42. Now I can go ahead and add those two equations together. And of course, as you see, the i2s drop out. Minus 8 minus 6 is a minus 14 I3 equals minus 56 plus 14, uh, 42 is a minus 14. Divide both sides by minus 14. And there we go. And so I3 equals 1 amp. Of course, the units for current is amp. So there we go. We now have found our first current, I3. So now we can go back to either one of these two equations right here and solve for I2. So maybe this equation might be the best one to use. So I'm going to use this equation right here to solve for the second current. Bring that one over here. And here we can see that we have the equation 4I2 minus, oh, that's kind of confusing here. Yeah, let, me, let me just go put a solid line around it so that's better here. We're taking this equation right here, bring it over here. So 4I2 minus 2I3 minus 14 equals 0. Now what we're doing is we're going to plug in the value for I3 into this equation. Now we end up with an equation with just only one unknown, I2, and we can solve for that. So we have 4I2 minus 2 times 1 minus 14 equals 0. Now we're putting all the numbers to the right side of the equation. So we have 4I2 equals a minus 2 to the other side becomes a plus 2, and a minus 14 to the other side becomes a plus 14. So we have 4I2 equals 16. Divide both sides by 4, and we have I2 equals 4 amps. And there's our second current. All right, so that means I2 now is 4 amps. 
And then finally we go to the third equation, or the, in this case it was the first equation, where we have I1 in terms of I2 and I3, so I1 was equal to I2 plus I3, and there we can say that I2 was equal to 4 amps, that would be 4 amps, and I1, uh, I3 was equal to 1 amp, so here we can see that I1 therefore is 5 amps. And there's our traditional Kirchhoff's rules method to solve the currents in any circuit. Of course, once you found the currents in the circuit, then all you have to do is multiply the currents times the resistances to get the three voltage drops across the resistances. But there you go. Now you can pick whatever method you feel most comfortable with to solve a circuit problem with that has more than two, more than one voltage source. And hmm, I'm still partial to the old superposition theorem, but Kirchhoff's rules is really great. Uh, very simplistic, very straightforward. Again, if you're going to do Kirchhoff's rules, do it exactly the way I showed you here. Make sure that you start out with this equation, get two loops, and then finally solve for one of the currents in terms of the other two, and plug that into the other two loop equations, and then solve the two equations to a known problem to its finish, and then you go ahead and use the first equation to find the third current. And that's really the best way to do it. Okay, there you go, Kirchhoff's rules in multi-voltage circuits.